Alrighty. Next up, I get to deal with the Dark Dilemma part of this. Morning review. It's 8 a.m. the day of the next show. Too early for Timothy to join, but this is still an event. The grounds are bustling with activity, practice, preparation, setup, and chatter. Timothy has been reviewing the routine with Monica for the last hour. Very good, Timothy. You've gone from a struggling boy to a competent young man. You learn as fast as your father. Timothy blushes, looks down, looking, feeling a little embarrassed. Let me get this thing done. Oh, whatever. Really? You think I'm gonna... You think I'm kind of like him? Thanks, but it wasn't just me. You've been so patient and attentive, informative. I could have learned this without you. Looks at Monica, showing a big smile. Don't, under, oh, don't understand yourself. Only you could have picked this up so quickly. All you needed was a little help. I was here, so I provided. Easy as that. I'm so lucky to have found you. To think you were hiding amongst my father's belongings. It's like a miracle. An angel friend who came down to help me. Not like the people around here who just ignore a boy who can learn fast like them. Just needs a teacher. Fists ball up a bit. Tears start to form. Voice a little strained. Why was that so hard? Did they have to hurt me? <coughs> yeah, that sounds natural. Uh, where was I? There. Give her that note. This is the grand lie of Iraq. Let no one can help another unless there's good reason. The rest of the world knows the truth. Be kind to others, help them, and the world will become better than ever. I know, I know now, if only the others understood. But I know they won't listen, even with you beside me. But you stuck in this fib. At least you showed me, and now I can do something. Indeed, young Timothy, you perform with two batons. Th th that's true, but I meant something else. I've shaken off the chains and now know how to behave with other people. I must find ways to help them, even if they don't want it. Wait. You're not wrong. People of Iraq will never ask for help. Ever. It's up to you to find ways to arrange it, but that is a thought for another day. When you're all grown up and set out on your journey to help the world, today you have a job. I do? I taught you to twirl two batons. That wasn't all, was it? Didn't we practice using the troops' routine? Yeah, and then I, how did I teach you to do something you didn't know? I have no footage of them practicing, but, well, I showed you. You recorded it, and that was it. So you memorized it in full. But, but yeah, I, I practiced so many times with the others. I saw it over and over and end. Learn the full routine on your own. You just needed to not drop the batons, which will no longer be an issue. In fact, you should be able to toss and catch them with the others. Would you agree? I, I should be able, no problem. But what am I getting at? Timothy, you are a talented young man. You know the routine. You can impro improv if needed, but otherwise can do a two twirl now. So, why wait a month to pass, when you can perform extremely well right now? I thought I heard commotion outside, like the circus is preparing for something. Oh, well, you you can't meet. But I, Timothy Stadder, managed to get the words out. What Monica is implying is ridiculous. All right, I have to actually fix these. Two hyphen. There's only five of them. That's the first one. That's the second one. And the next. Oh, I gotta look up flaming as well. Looks like there's a few of these. Oh, 
All right, then I have to do like, uh, there's only a few instances of this. That gets a capital T, F. That's an F, not a T. That was also lowercase. That needs a capital. It's a name of something. Come on now. All right, that's all of them. All right, back to the top. This is... Robert wants you gone, pure and simple. We've got over... We've gone over this ad his attempts to manipulate you. Even struck you with his hand. Out because he assumed you wouldn't need aid. And when it was clear that he, that was wrong, he realized he made a mistake. He can't just admit to it, or do a responsible thing and amend it. Instead, he made a show of your feelings, and how you are sticking the circus. Let's italicize these instead of quoting them. Boop. And... That goes away. That goes away. It's not his responsibility, apparently, to assure the success of his business. If it were, he'd order you to be taught. And yet he didn't. And even now is drinking in his tent. The epitome of a long-time citizen of Iraq. But we needn't play this game. We have chips now. I'm not quite following. I understand you want me to join the show, but he'd never allow it. He hasn't even... It hasn't even been a month yet. Shouldn't I keep practicing until it's perfect? If you're already perfect as it is, there's no need to run this out. You can perform now, and this is where we hit back at Robert. He'd never expect you to approach him with a wager, when then he knows you'd fail. Alright. I should probably note that's only been a few days of practice. I know there's been a couple of days. Alright, so I am down to here. Why would I make a bet? What would I even put up? Your job, of course. Your role in the circus. You're going to bet your career here on tonight's show. Timothy is floored with his idea. His jaw is actually dropped, arms sagging, and eyes just staring at Monica. It was either in his hands or, I guess, lying on a table. That was going to be awkward. Let me explain. You are perfectly ready now. If you wait for the month, no matter how well you perform, Robert will just make up a reason to get rid of you anyway. Probably something like, It took you a full month to learn the simple routine. We can't waste time with this. Like this with every performance. You just play us down. I expect you to learn much more quickly. In fact, I think, I know, you purposely waited until the last minute just so we can suffer more. I have no doubt he'd do this. Timothy shivers all over. His legs give out and plops on the floor, staring down. His lips quiver and the tears flow. He thought Robert would keep his word that he'd actually let him stay after all the hardships. He is Charlie's son, after all. Family. Family. No, not family. Robert said to himself. Robert yelled at him and hit him. Robert starts to really understand his situation. Timothy starts to really, to really understand his situation. That Monica has been absolutely right. Robert is a manipulative son of a bitch. He'll say anything to win an argument and will contradict himself while blaming any misunderstandings on the other person. He never takes responsibility and doesn't even manage anything. He promises his promise of one last chance Surely was a grand lie. He's going to get rid of Timothy one way or another. Timothy sits there for ten minutes. Say sags instead. Thinking and rethinking over these facts. His tears stop. The tear seeking settles. He looks up. You know this to be true. We need to stand up to him. But not in the way he expects. We need to pull... Oh, that's Monica speaking. You know this to be true. We need to stand up to him, but not in the way he expects. We need to pull the rug out from under him. How do I get to his tent and make him this bet? You will perform in today's show. If it, if it is not up to his standards, then you will leave today. 
Never to return and never to tell anyone you were ever here. Be steadfast and keep pushing. You'll take it, for certain. And when you go out there and perform to perfection, you'll be completely floored, shocked at your incredibly quick progress, but defeated. Peter should recognize you, and with his approval, Robert can't just make a reason to get rid of you. As it has been just a few days, and in that time, you've fixed your problems. No one can find fault in you anymore. But first, you must get Robert to agree. You need some confidence. But being nervous is also good. You'll make Robert think you're panicking, making it making a wager beyond your capabilities. This will work in our favor. This is going to be tough, but I have to do it. He'll just toss me out if I take too long. He won't even give me the one month. He'll probably come in drunk and kick me out in two weeks. A fair point. Uh. Okay, I just have to go up to him, bet my life on tonight's show, and hope he agrees. I'll have to keep trying if he wastes me away, maybe question his abilities again, remind him of how much he hates me. I don't want to get hit again. I think I can take it this time. Ugh. He will be victorious in this, I guarantee it. Even if he retaliates in some way, if we get him to agree enough, he'll agree to it. That's just how predictable he is. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I I should do this now. Wish me luck, Ma Master. Timothy manages to stop himself from calling Monica Mom. She picks up on this. You don't need any. You have this, my precious student, like my own child. Timothy heads out. Robert's office is a st small, sing single, small tent. To the back is a couch, and on the left side is a chair and table with an attempt at a house of cards. Cards just sit there, flat, some ripped, and on the grass. In the center is a large trunk on top of which rests the legs of Robert. He sips out his bottle only to find it empty. He tosses it to the right side of the tent, where it smashes to pieces along with dozens of others. He reaches into the trunk, finds a bottle of wine, opens it, and continues to lean back and relax, staring at the top of the tent. Timothy approaches the tent, base beeline straight for it. He can't slow down, or the nerves could get, get him. He chooses not to announce himself like normal, partially because he's a bit too nervous to do it, but also because it'll start Robert off angry. Because... Skipping this will start Robert off angry. Monica has read Robert well. He's a ball of rage. Hmm. Timothy crosses into the tent, brushing the flap aside and walking straight up to the trunk. Robert hears this and knows someone just walked in without permission. He's going to destroy whatever little shit just showed up in respect. He tilts forward, lowering his gaze to find Timothy. I don't know why you need us to announce ourselves. We all know you're a drunkard and what's really in that trunk. You don't hide it well, at all. Robert freezes. Timothy just walked into his office, unannounced at that, and insulted him. He doesn't quite understand what just happened. The shock has paralyzed his system briefly. All right. Nobody's speaking confidently for that. Whatever, I don't care about your attempts to save face. I'm here on important business, something you'd like to hear. You, yeah, how dare you speak to me in this way? Still taken off guard by Timothy's impudence. Uh, he startles, but shinks noticeably. It doesn't matter, I talk to you. You treat me like garbage anyway. It doesn't matter, I have an offer. One you can't refuse. Tough what offer? That you'd serve in my new trunk? You would feel accomplished knowing your back was reporting my feet. Your little frame's not nearly worthy enough that I might the honor. Get back to the train and keep crying. Robert's starting to get his senses back, but makes up something half drunkenly. I would have placed my talents trying to support those mushy logs. Just get a wheelchair and have some assistant drive you around. That'd be more your speed. Slow. Just like how dumb you think I am. I'll have you know, he stops himself almost giving up his hand, that he's learned the tutorial. He makes up something else. That I 
Look at another job better than practice. Put me in today's show and... <laughs> Robert bursts out laughing uncontrollably. He struggles for breath. God, that was terrible. His body aching, going from rage to laughter. Timothy reaffirms. I don't perform to your expect standards. If I do, then I stay. If not, then I I will leave. Immediately. I'll pack my things and walk away. You'll never hear from me again. And I won't tell anyone about my time here, and none will find out. Robert is still chuckling. Looking amusingly at Timothy. He takes a good swig, stops, and thinks. Yeah, Vermont. I recommend you. I shove it. I can do it once I'm on stage. I'm sure I can. I don't need a month. I just need to be live. Then I can perform on the same level as the others. I know it. And if I fail, you'll be rid of me sooner. A good thing, a good time for a celebratory drink. Robert mulls this over. The boy speaks true. This would be a grand chance to finally get rid of him. The flaming two troll is dead. He needs to move on. But the boy gave hope of his revival. Hope that he squandered. So much time and money has been spent on him. And to no avail. Why wait a month when he can be out the door now? It's not like he's going to succeed anyway. Robert only made that ultimatum to appear fair to the others. He just finds some other way to get rid of the useless shit later. I do need an occasion for some of my elders, uh, the spicy sort. Uh, I do like the idea of drinking last performance, but usually it's hole in my pocket. But I don't like the idea of performing the act elsewhere. It's just a ploy to steal our work. Timothy is no longer nervous before this failure of a man, but plays up some of his nerves and sells the bet. I swear, on oh, my father's grave, on his life, my love for him. I swear on his name, in his honor. If I am to leave, I will just go to an orphanage and as an abandoned child. I will give up on twirling and get into another job. I won't, be, won't even pursue batons as a hobby. Uh, well, that's quite a commitment. You may be a freeloader and a chief, but I see honesty in your eyes. Well, you're terrible batons anyway, no further use to me. You're better off planting trees and reaching for the sky. You've finally grown up a bit. Still nothing like your father, but that was impossible to begin with. Very well then, kid. You're in the show. Just try to make it really funny this time. I need a good laugh in my stretchful life. Deal. Timothy extends a hand to shake it. Robert coughs on the hand, spitting up some gunk. He leans back and turns to relaxing, chuckling to himself. Timothy wipes the gunk on the trunk and heads back to the trailer. He has work to do, but to not lose himself to to not lose himself to nerves. Fortunately, Monica would be there waiting for him, ready to help him succeed, like a mother should. And thus the illusion keeps going. The circus performs its various acts as normal. The crowd is mostly disinterested, though. They heard of a comedy routine and wish to see it themselves. Robert easily picks up on this, holding on, holding in his doing rage. Eventually, the main act is up. Robert introduces them and gets off stage. He stands in a darkened corner, pulling out some whiskey and waiting for the grand finale, the last act of a worthless kid. The audience grows quiet, some pointing to Timothy and chuckling and chuckling. In the troop's eyes, the audience is a pack of vultures, swarming and waiting for the kill. They can't believe the kid is in another act, wondering if Peter lost his mind. They are unaware that Robert ordered this of Peter. He spoke of the marvelous progress the boy had made, that not putting him in would be a great loss. The audience will surely be loud. Peter doesn't believe this, thinking it was the drunken musings of a washed-up ringmaster. But he diligently follows orders. He helps Timothy can manage this time. If he can't, Peter knows his troop will lose trust in him and his position as lead performer will come into question. This act can't fail. Timothy better measure up. Robert, of course, lied about everything. Once Timothy blunders, he can claim that the kid did improve incredibly, but didn't take the performance seriously. Robert will accept the responsibility, but will keep shoving blame onto Timothy regardless. Hmm. Well. Formally. Quote, accept. Robert will formally accept responsibility, but will keep shoving blame onto Timothy regardless. 
And finally, Robert can be rid of the false prophet, a useless kid who's been nothing but trouble. He pities the orphanage he's going to dump him off at. Really, is that right? All right. Regardless of how everyone feels, the act begins. It is much the same as the previous. For a few minutes, they do a one twirl. Timothy does what's fine. Then the second batons drop, and in, in unison, all clasp theirs tightly in hand. There is no thump on the ground, no hurried breaths, brief silence as all have caught their batons. The act me immediately continues after this scheduled pause. Peter and the troops spin their batons and throw them to each other in perfect sync. Once more, there are, no, there are no sounds nor sights of dropped batons. Timothy is giving up, and then some. His body is in position slightly ahead of the rest, but he quickly fixes this and stays in sync otherwise. This act is performed at the top speed the performers can manage. Alright. The troop. The top speed of the troop can manage, yet still Timothy was faster. The troops see this and hold in their surprise, not even fumbling, as he, much as some might. They are professionals, after all, yet inside they are perplexed. How could this kid be faster and better than them? Peter is relieved on the inside. Robert was actually not bullshitting him. Robert is having multiple successive near heart attacks. At the catch, he dropped his whiskey on the floor. After the pause and getting the brief a brief breath, he exhaled everything in him as Timothy perfectly performed a true twirl. As he watched, he struggled to breathe, clasping his heart, now pounding like a jackhammer. He noticed Timothy had to slow down. This nearly kneeled, ke keeled him over. His mind raced, thinking of how this was possible. It must be the whiskey. He's seeing things, surely. But the crowd's not laughing. They're silent. Robert realizes that this is real. The weight of the bed sinks into his chest, and his heart skips a few beats. This is not the end to Robert's torment, nor Timothy's rise to stardom. Something unexpected happens during the act. Perhaps someone overlooks something, or an outside hand interfered. None know what caused it, but once it does, Timothy continues like it's nothing. Robert hits the floor, fetal and gasping. After the show, the crowd claps, a high level of recognition from the A.B. Rock audience. Excited whispers permeate the tent, along with confused glances from the troop to Timothy. Did he practice that? Was it natural? How did he do it? A rare sight in Biroc. People who are at a complete loss. That needs a colon, not a comma. The crowd exits. They talk more loudly about the act, about the kid who didn't stand out, not in costume nor demeanor. A good ploy to surprise them, they supposed. But the crux of the conversation is about how the unexpected it was to have him be the star and how nonchalant the, the act was in general with respect to what the kid was doing for the second half. It's like it was no effort at all, not even worth mentioning. They will keep talking and spread word about the boy performed a flaming tutorial. Robert is nowhere to be seen. He's long since crawled into another tent. Peter approaches Timothy, surprised to say the least, but proud. You were spectacular. When Robert said you'd be in the act, I... I thought he'd gone insane. He mumbled something about disrespect and a bet. I made a wager. Let me perform today and I will meet his standards. If not, then I'll leave. He wouldn't have to wait a full month. Taken aback by a young man's confidence. I don't know what happened to you in these couple of days, but it's done you good. Yes, the ultimatum had a profound effect on you. Finally, realize your situation and learn to focus. I'm glad to see you've all right, I have finally twice right there. Glad to see you understand. You're now part of. You're now on the same page as the rest of us. There's no free ride around here. We all have to do our parts perfectly. Only then can we put on a magnificent show. Timothy holds back the symbols. Thanks. It means a lot coming from you. I'm certain that I will keep performing to a up, up to and beyond expectations. But I will strive to perfect my skill, and with you all we will continue to put on grand shows, wowing the audience. Peter nod, nods with a smile. Maybe with less mishaps this time. Though it really shocked them when the batons caught fire. Some of the others were noticeably shocked as well. It really shook the audience. 
Think you can do that again? Definitely. I don't even need... Warding. I'll make it work on the fly. This is my natural talent, after all. I'll see about adding this to the app. The Flaming Two Twirl has returned. Rumored's face was priceless. He never thought he'd lose that bet. I would be careful about talking to him to yourself. Let him call you in. Alright, I need to make this a serious tone for this part. Let him call you in. He's going to need some time to process this. Once he does, you'll realize you're in a talent and we'll have to dress it. And he'll have to address it. But for now, he's going to be a tad angry. Don't need to tell me. Touches his cheek. Peter looks concerned at this. I didn't agree with what he did. He's very emotional, as you now know. I don't think he'd do it again, though. As long as you give him the respect he wants. Leans in close and whispers, Not the respect he deserves. Pats Timothy on the back, then walks off. Other members of the troop walk up and say minor congrats. They're all awkward about it, but generally admit that they were mistaken about Timothy, at least to some degree. A few even say he was good, and some apologize about the chastising. But they all do this quickly and run off, hoping no one heard them. The remaining members scoff to themselves, not accepting this. They hold no respect nor like of the boy, and would surely ditch him somewhere if they could. Timothy has finally earned some repertoire with the others in the act. He'll have to work harder, but he knows he can he can form a working relationship with these people now. Not that he has now that he has shown he can keep up and perform on another level, if not higher. Confidence starts to brew in the little man, but he puts a stopper on it. Can't get overconfident now. Robert, however, is mulling over everything in his little tent. He knows this is a farce. There's no way Timothy could have performed this well, not after all the floundering. And yet he did. Something is wrong here. He has to get to the bottom of it. Timothy rarely left his trailer these last few days. The secret must be inside. He gathers himself, standing shakily. He leaves for the trailer while Timothy talks to the others. Robert will dig up whatever bullshit the kid cooked up to make a fool out of him. He doesn't hide what he's doing, just walks up and into the trailer. Rifles through everything he can find for anything that could explain the situation. He comes upon the tablet of Monica, curly with a black screen, pretending to be off. He holds it, holds it curiously. There's no way the kid would have something like this. Maybe it's an old keepsake of Charlie's? Something from childhood that holds no purpose now? He hits the resumed on button. Yeah, button rather than switch. But the screen stays blank. Not even a hum. Broken, whatever, piece of junk. Tosses the tablet aside and keeps digging. Monica thinks to herself. Perfect. He's doubtful of Timothy's progress. The fool can't even tell I'm playing dead. A true buffoon living in Birak. How has this thing survived to this point? No matter, I suppose. This little act has nearly reached its conclusion. Just have to wait for the hero to arrive. Its villain can finally be, can finally be vanquished. Continues to be in sleep mode. Robert spends a good five minutes working up a sweat, to no avail. He gives up and will just wait for Timothy to return. Then he'll spot something. The man waits on the other side of the trailer, quickly losing patience but persevering. Ugh. Timothy gleefully skips back to his trailer, eager to tell Monica of his success. He bounds inside, picks her up, and hugs the tablet. I'm glad to see you're doing good. Shall I presume it all went beyond expectations? It was amazing. And I, <laughs> I kept up with everyone. The sw he describes the show. And that lit my batons on fire. I just kept going, unfazed. Everyone was shocked, I could tell. The audience was stunned silent. It's just like when my dad was on stage. Complete silence in the crowd. He feels his heart warm, all tickly inside. It's like he's back. You are his son. In your confidence, demeanor, professionalism, and talent. You inherited it all, and in time will surpass even his grand act. Timothy, Timothy feels the warming embrace of a heartwarming compliment and encouragement. 
fire. I need to change that. That's warming twice. It's been so long since he's felt this way. Feels the warming embrace of a kind-hearted compliment. This is how life is supposed to feel. We work together and become stronger, better, like a family. I feel great pride in you, my student, my student. Timothy's heart swells. He caught that slip. Monica is like the mother he never knew, and she sees him just the same. His life is going to be a good one. He knows it. Now that he has Monica's support and motherly love. And when he's an adult, he will travel around with the circus. But in his off time, will find ways to help people. Even if they don't ask, but only if they need it. This is his beginning. The trailer door opens and slaps shut. Timothy looks over. His face instantly pales. Eyes quiver and body frozen. Robert moves in. A large mass quickly taking up Timothy's entire view. The boy can't move. Can't speak. Robert, however. So, this is your little secret, huh? A tablet with all sorts of videos and personal assistant. How lucky for you. Give it here, snatches Monica. Monica adopts a robotic voice like I've been trying this entire time. Excuse me, how may I help you today? Would you like to know the forecast for the week? Or perhaps the number one song? Robert spits to the side. Got the crappy little harlot. I heard everything. The kid's been to get an help. It was it is doing today's show. It was a rouge cooped up the both of you. Think you can play me like a fool? I'm not so naive to think a boy I could perform so well so quickly. Now I should plan for the start, wasn't it? There's a Timothy, still frozen. Pretend like you can't do a simple tutorial. Get it all worked up and then BAM! A miracle performance. Like you're a savant. Then we all, we all have to ask for your forgiveness and your bashing of love and attention. How sickening. How could one of Charlie's blood come up with this plan? To do that to your own family? Not family. You said I said no such thing, boy. I saw you. Only saw you as a son. And be stabbed in the back like this. How dare you? Monica returns to her normal voice. It was my doing, sir. Please. I wanted to help the boy, and I suppose I took advantage of his desire for help. Please forgive him. He's a good kid. Kind, devoted boy. He deserves the chance to prove himself, which I'm certain he did today. Were you not impressed? Robert holds Monica face to face. And what it is doing is yours. Anyone can copy our routine, but few can bring it to life. What I saw was a kid falling along. Nothing more. And I, I felt it. The, the life, the performance, the, the rhythm with everyone. And when the batons lit up, I stepped up even further. Yes, he did. I didn't teach him anything but how to twirl two batons. Everything else was him. You must have wrecked it. How? You, you did. That, that's all. Monica, Monica helped me a lot, but I'm the one who was up there. I did the routine, twirled, and sh took the show by storm with burning batons. That was a spit on Charlie's face. You didn't him no honor. Just shattered his memory. Ah, that is a bit of... burps a little. Belchies. And you, I should have smashed you earlier. I knew something like you should have been here. Monica whispers. I was playing asleep, you imbecile. Can't you even trust your own instincts so lost in your drink? It's clear why the circus was hit hard, has hit hard times. The entire budget is sealed in your trunk. Timothy will surpass everyone's expectations and leave the circus to true greatness. All while you rot in your little tent. Your little world of shame of regret. Now roll away, you tub of lard. We have a celebration to get to, and a washed up, grotesquely fat, stifling, and retarded worm is ruining the mood. Robert's face explodes scarlet, grip tightens around Monica. You fucking little slut, you think I can talk to me like that? Monica hams it up. Please, sir, I only asked for Timothy's forgiveness. Was my reasoning unsatisfactory? I'll try again, if you would please. Fucking fuck, 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 I'm gonna smash you to pieces, tell you to bring a part of your AI core out. And you should have that softball throw against the wall. I'll get every fiber out of you. Stop, please, please stop. She didn't do anything wrong. She, she helped, she helped a strongly boy. She reached out to him. This is something everyone should be doing, helping each other when they're in need. We can accomplish so much if we just work together. 
Just as a shit you're feeding this shit, he was invalid to begin with. A useless pile of meat who couldn't be bothered to even try. So much time wasted on him, and now he seems to think it's normal. He's too far gone to be safe now. This is the truth of the word. If I hadn't stepped in, the Flaming Two Troll would truly be dead. If you just listen, you'd understand. Please, just set me down, and we can talk this out. We don't need to fight like this. Think of Timothy. All right, I need to note this in the beginning tone. All right, that's in the beginning tone. Need to note some of these. There's a lot going on here that's not being noted. This should potentially escalate. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's enough, I guess. Enough, you're gonna die. I'm gonna enjoy every little sound pulling your watch out of making you scream. Please, stop. I'm begging you. Please stop this. Say goodbye, you little helper, you con artist. Robert starts to raise his hand high, preparing to throw Monica to the floor. Timothy tries to move, but can do nothing but clutch his batons. Monica is at neck level. She opens a side port. A small electrode shoots directly into Robert's neck, discharging thousands of volts. In but a moment, Robert stops dead, wailing in pain. I had hoped not to do this, not in front of my son, but I had no choice. Please, just go to sleep, and when you wake up, we'll talk this over. Robert staggers for a moment, but grasps the wires, working them out. He pants and reaffirms his grip. You thought this would stop me? I'm a big man, not a little runt, you piece of shit. You, you've crossed the line this time. I was just joking before, but this time I'm serious. Take your last picture. I'll never see the light of day. Arm raises to its full length above his head, stands wobbling. Monica will sniff. I'm so sorry about all of this. Timothy, you're a good boy. You'll become a great man. This may be where we part, but always be there in your heart. Robert's leg f legs firm, his arm tenses. He picks the spot to slam Monica. A grin spins. A grin spreads across his face. Eyes are lit with a crazed glare. Goodbye, I love you, son. Robert's arm reaches his fo even, even further back. He steps in and throw. <laughs> throw. <laughs> he stumbles forward, body loosening. Loosening. He stands for still for a moment. Exhaling a bourbon breath. Arms drop to his sides. Shins hit the ground as he kneels. Briefly wonders why he can't see the ruined remains of the trashy tablet. But that's a thought for later. First, it's time for a little nap. He face plants the floor, blood seeping out the back of his head. Just behind is Timothy, with a cracked baton, blood coated on the end. Minutes pass. No sound but the faint, dazed breast of an eleven-year-old boy. His fingers loosen, dropping the baton. Hmm. Dropping his baton. The blood bloodied one chips when it lands. Ruined, if that even matters. Reality sets in, and Timothy buckles over on the ground, heaving and convulsing. Monga talks softly. It's okay, little Timothy. It's okay. Sings a little lullaby to soothe the boy. I... Ah, uh, you did right. It wasn't good, but you had no other choice. It was him or me. He didn't give you any other options. He made the situation himself. You are not to blame. Alright, how do you keep this assault? Robert was dead long before he ever entered this trailer. He was single-handedly root-sinking the circus. This was bound to happen eventually. If not between him, you and me, then someone else. Likely him and Peter would have ha had it out, and he'd have died through Peter's hand. There is no way for Robert to avoid this kind of fate. It just happened to be you. That's all. Timothy listens closely to Mona, no, to Mom's words. She's right for the most part. Robert was a terrible person and did nothing for the circus. He was going to die anyway. It just happened to be here and now. But this feeling of guilt... Having hit someone, having killed him, Timothy pukes. It's all right, my boy. It'll get better in time. But we have one little task left, if you can bear with it. Timothy looks up, wipes the vomit from his mouth. Yes, Mom? 
We have to deal with the body. It can't stay here. The others can't learn how we really died. Uh, how, how can I move him? You won't. I have the contact information for an old friend of your father's. In fact, he is quite near. He'll handle this thing to my side. And then we can give a, have a long talk. A friend? Yes, an old confidant. He saw your show and was quite impressed. He wants to help however he can. Just like it should be, right? Timothy nods. Right, I'll measure him. He should come in very soon. Timothy waits on the floor. He tries to sit up, but his stomach's not having it. No, stomach ap apostrophe asked you bloody all correct. After two minutes, the door opens and gently shuts. Shuts. He looks down. He looks down. Just looks up, as he's on the floor. He looks up and sees a man who kneels next to him. I've heard so much about you, Timothy. I was actually in the audience for your previous performance. I saw how you struggled, but tried with your all. I want to speak with you afterwards, but the others got you first. I was sickened to my stomach from how they treated you. That's no way to treat a boy, and one who's trying with all his might to succeed. I knew I had to do something. There's something I never told you, son. It's the reason you never found me before. You see, when your father reached success and you were about to be born, he realized that he could, didn't need to hold on to me any more. I could be of help to others. So he called upon this man and handed me off to him. But then... Uh, oh, that makes sense. That's why I didn't know about you. I kind of wondered why I never found you when I was little, when I would sneak peeks at my dad's old things. So you were gone by then? She was with me, then another fellow of mine, a friend. But he was just a tad creepy for her, so I got her back, and she's been with me for some years. Then I saw your struggles and decided to act immediately. I placed Monica with your trailer, within your trailer, and let her do her thing, teaching an honest young boy and the son of one of the most your most precious students. Thank you. Thank you so much. I want to repay you. How can I? No, you needn't offer anything in return. This is what it means to help others. He helped you because it was right, not because he expected something in return. Hmm. All right. Well said, although I will ask for one little thing. After I move this oaf and frame his death as an accident, will you listen to my story? I have a little tale for you and an offer. Your father had the same choice, but perhaps your answer will be different. I'd love to talk with Mom and Dad's old friend. What was your name? My true name I can't speak aloud, but you can call me Tender. Tender gets up, hoists Robert's corpse, and hops out. You will place him in storage and slam a heavy crate of against his head. An accident, nothing more. Comma. He'll grab a bottle of booze, Plant that, and it'll be obvious to everyone that Robert was drunk, as usual. Robert's body will be found within the hour, and the circus will be in an uproar. But Timothy will have other concerns. Not that anyone looks for him. Why would they? Even if foul play were involved, he'd have nothing to gain. Not after that show. Tender, Monica, and Timothy all have a long talk about Burak and the rest of the world. Tender reveals that he's part of an external organization called CARE. Join some time after parting with Charlie. As the name implies, they're all very caring towards others and the world as a whole. But they will do everything in their power to ensure success. Even if it means getting a little dirty. There are some of the world who don't give care a chance, give care a choice, much like how Robert didn't give Timothy any. Robert forced Timothy into that position, much like how some nations force others into unpleasant situations, and even more terrible decisions that must be made. For the most part, though, care will accomplish world peace through community and integration of everyone into one organization, like a giant family. Timothy follows everything. It all makes sense. His, expression, his experiences the last few days have proved to him, without a doubt, that everyone tender has, everything Tender has said is correct. Even his mom has corroborated it. That's all he needs to hear. And now we come to the big choice. You're a little young for this, but you've matured quite a lot. I think it's time. What is it, Uncle? When you were just a baby, 
I returned to Charlie Pan Alpha. Leave Burak. Leave? Just like that? Just go? Yes, I offered to take him and you to a neighboring nation, maybe to join care. I knew he'd want to, and could raise a boy in a less strict and present environment. I even told him how much he could earn as a one-man show. Burak's standards are so ridiculously high to, that anyone, and I do mean anyone, raised here can become extremely successful elsewhere. That's part of the reason why the borders are closed. Uh, Burak doesn't want their talent leading to other nations. Kind of selfish, don't you think? That's terrible. People should be able to leave if they are not happy. I never knew this, but it makes complete sense. They don't want to share it even to lend a hand. That's just how messed up Burak is. But out there in the rest of the world, there's great opportunity. You and I could be quite happy. You'd be better than most, guaranteed. Than most, than everyone. That's good. I second that. Today's act was beyond anything I've ever seen. And I've been to a lot of shows. You have an immeasurable talent. Just need the right environment to bloom. A circus was your father's home, but Robert has made it clear that... Robert has made it clear he never thought of him as anything more than profit. There's no love here. But out there... Then let's leave. I want to be part of care in any way I can. As long as I don't have to hurt someone again. But maybe if I had to... That's right. Care doesn't do anything beyond reason unless another party forces them into that situation. Unless another party forces them. Sometimes we all have to do what's necessary. It's the other party's fault, not ours, not yours. This, this just happens sometimes. <coughs> Alright, I've been talking for too long. The best we can do is handle it quickly, efficiently, and be done with it. Move on. Exactly. We can achieve great things together. Timmy, shall we prepare? Yes, I'll pack my things so we can go. That's the spirit. We've got a long road ahead of you. One of joy and laughter. Timothy spends the afternoon packing up his things. Tender heads out to prepare his side. He tries to call in, but can't get through for some reason. He figures Rad messed something up, but it doesn't matter, as Timothy is going to come with him to the base anyway. He will just report me directly. Tinder is curious about the two friend found. Maybe they'll make good friends with Timothy. Yes, in the future, Timothy may well be an outside contact for the other kids. Well, that's something for Vet to deal with. Tender will escort Timothy to the base after midnight. They need the circus to go to sleep. Can't go wandering around a Burak circus with everyone everyone's, when anyone's awake. Tender can manage, but Timothy would be caught. No reason to take chances now. Tender's mission is a success. He can wait to finish it. Personally, he is quite pleased that everything went exactly as he thought. When Timothy performed so exceptionally well, and after making that bet with Robert, the oaf lost it. He searched for how the boy managed to do it and learned of Monica. Monica really played up her intention to help Timothy and how Timothy benefited so much. And that is what's right. That this is what's right. Robert, of course, went into a rage and tried to destroy Monica. Timothy reacted and struck Robert. Dender just expected the man to be knocked out, but was impressed Timothy swung hard enough to kill him. Very good indeed. Timothy wanted this exchange of ideals and sided with care, even if he didn't realize it. Timothy even managed to gather himself other afterwards, likely because he grew so immensely attached to Monica. Tender didn't expect his mother angle, but Monica undid herself once more. Timothy so easily fell for this his manipulation, it's amusing. Alright, that's total 16 noted. Good old manipulation on all fronts. No problem with that, I guess. Alright, now for this one. Routed. It's the early evening, around 7 p.m. Um, let's see.
hours after mir today's miracle performance. The sun had begun to set over the horizon, striking amber light throughout the sky. Linda and Mike are eating their last meal within the confines of the campus. This has been quite a little trip, but finally they can end this farce. Once out, they can, they'll send a message to their former colleagues and let them clean up this little care mess. For now, they'll have to stomach Noff and Ruth's sickening gazes and giggles. The kids shudder to think any adult can act this way. We're being invaded, cracks over the walkies. The kids are stunned for a moment, unsure what to make of this. Of... The lover agents immediately pick up their walkies and prepare themselves for battle. Linda recovers first, just a second to do so. Mike takes two. She knows that was Surly's voice, so he must have seen them on the cameras. Must have seen something on the cameras. This at least won't be a total surprise, but it is odd how this is happening now. She and Mike haven't done anything, told anyone yet. Unless they've been monitoring the radios all this time. They're trying to be stealthy, but the cams were strategically placed just for this reason. They're all at the outskirts, but making good pace. The uniforms are those of local authorities, and there's a two dozen of them, split into four teams of six. Just tell me what the Just tell me where they are and we'll have a second honeymoon. He holds the walkie to his greeting mouth, eyes on fire. You will find them easily enough. Red and I will hold things down here. Swift's already been sent out to distract some of them. But don't get cocky. There's definitely more coming. Damn, they're on the roof. I can hear faint chopping blades. The rocks got some damn quiet choppers. Two teams are beelining this way. They know this is command. They've done their research. In that case, we have no time. Swift. Ah. Swift, gather any stragglers. Everyone head to Fisher. Everyone else. Everyone else head to Fisher. We'll meet there and determine our options. Knopf, Ruth, and Stomp are to eliminate the threat and safe out the others. The rest. Be safe. Good look, slam. Vet cries out in the background and a scuffle is heard. The walkie clicks off. Mike stuffs the last of his meal into his mouth and stands, looking at Linda. She nods. They know they'll get roped into this if they're not careful. They'll need to act like hostages. Go with the agents, and when met with the officers, look like they're happy to see them and signal the others without, without the others seeing. For now, they'll have to head to Fisher. Alright. So, the Fisher then. No way, not with so many of Barak's officers on site. I can finally get some closure. If we kill everyone, you two will have nothing to worry about. You can't follow us. You can follow us and we'll make a fun little slide, slips and slide for you. Don't worry, let's not, not, let's not that gro gross up close. Winks. Over the radio, in a serious tone. Mike. Inner, ugh. Radio's back. Yeah. Where are you right now? In the cafeteria, my friend Linda, your psychotic fellows, Noff and Ruth. I call this a P242 situation. Let's out under. <laughs> Mike knows the campus radios interfere with the cops' radios. They'll definitely, they're definitely listening. This betrayal of information should go right over the agents' heads, especially the use of a police term P242. This will alert the cops that he's not just some kid. Good, you're in high spirits. You'll need it. And once you're. And since you're with the lovebirds, you two can get to me safely. Off walks over and puts his face right up to the walkie. Ah, oh, come on. They can walk themselves. It's not like, not like anyone's going to shoot the kids. Once they're safely with me, you two can get to the good old date. Besides, if we group up, won't that mean more officers will come after us? He has a point, honey. You're a good man, friend. Then it's settled. We'll take you two, too. We'll escort you. We'll take you two to the place of wins and losses. Best we aren't specific about the location. Everyone immediately thinks of the gym. They all head out in that direction. 
Noff in the lead, Roof in the back, and the couple will escort the kids to the gym, killing everyone who gets in their way. <clears throat> they exit and head around the corner. Noff peeks, sees nothing, they move into the nearby building. The group makes way down the hall, past bureau classrooms. Desks in the rows, the, leading, the learning screens cracked in places, and the back door is hanging off the hinges. Halfway down, they are met with a door slowly opening, three rooms down. Halfway through. The power couple quickly move in, eerily quiet, like panthers. The door opens in full, and an officer sticks his head out. Knopf grabs his head and casually twists it, grabbing the man's gun and using his now dead body as a human shield. The officers behind open up on Knopf, missing their comrade easily, despite Knopf's efforts to guide the body into the rounds. Ruth flashes past. These aren't real bullets, honey. They're being backgrounds of all things. Oh, then why am I bothering with this? Knopf drops the body, struts over, taking multiple rounds to the vital spots in sensitive areas. No effect. The kids peer in from the doorway, witnessing the duo's imperviousness to non-lethal rounds. Ruth rakes her fingernails into one man's eyes and stabs him in the balls. He crumples. The other four switch to stun and smoke grenades, each dropping one right at their feet, and hop back. Doctor smiles and walks right in, while Ruth runs out of the room and into the neighboring one. The four stun grenades go off and fill the room with a solid shockwave, then smoke billows out, clouding the entire area. With what the officers witness, pulling out what is the best course of action. Course of action. They'll head out the other door and call this in. Getting out the door is fine, but they won't be alone, as Ruth circled around. They anticipated this and so greeted her with hand-to-hand -hand combat. She avoids all the blows, expertly dodging. Yet she makes no effort to attack. The officers learn quickly why. Crack. The man in the back drops like a rock, his neck freshly snapped. Off gleaming behind him completely unaffected by the grenades. Not only that, he snuck up on them, again, and in a classroom disheveled by broken desks, desks, cracked tiles, and some plant life. His skill at stealth, observance, and killing are top-notch. The three remaining officers attempt to run for it, calling in backup. They don't make it five feet. Despite all the training of a bureauc officer, they lack true life-and-death combat experience. Knopf kicks one in the knee, shattering it. Roof takes a pencil snag from the classroom, pulls back an officer's goggles, and stabs him through the eye, nearly hitting the brain. The last one is shot in the back with a full clip of backgrounds, courtesy of Knopf. Alright, I need to note this real quick. When Knopf walks right in. All right, that'll work. The kids went around as well and can see the devastation left by these two. Two killed by broken necks, four maimed, and Noth completely immune to non lethal armaments. His code name is even more fitting now. That man gives no fucks about anything you bring into a fight. He'll conquer you even if you're... conquer you if you're not fully prepared. Shame we have to murder it. I'd like to get some more info from them. Like how they knew about us, you know. Looking right at off, she nonchalantly pushes the pencil deeper, restraining the downed man. So he can only shiver. Tell you what, pick one of these guys to live, and we'll come back later. Once it's all done and dealt with. Ooh, thanks, honey. Without looking, she forces the pencil the rest of the way. The man ceases moving. How about the man I emasculated? Not much merchandise we can threaten him with. True. Then the one with the broken knee. You've already started immobilizing him. Hmm. But then we can't break that knee. Oh, right, the guy over there. He's just been bagged down. I'll give him a good... I'll just give him a concussion and we'll deal with him later. Sounds good. Well, Noth gets a good knock to the already unconscious man. Roth pulls a razor and slits the throats of the remaining men. The kids just watch, sickened on the inside. They've never witnessed such violence, and so casually at that. Care has, some tr tr care has some terrifying people in it. It's a good thing Linda and Mike didn't get a chance to alert the cops to this place. Anyone there, 
any one their colleagues had sent would be too few in number. An absolute slaughter, and the agents would likely learn about the tip and oust the kids. They were saved, but it's going to cost a lot of officers. After this one minute encounter, the group continues on. They shortly arrive at the gym. Friend is sitting on a beat on a bleacher, playing with a knife. He looks up when the door is open, ready to fight, but relieved to see his fellows. Linda, my, good to see you're okay. We can't have our newest recruits dying on us. These two ensure that we wouldn't happen. Took out an entire squad handily. Very impressive. It's what we trained for our whole life. And we've been in worse situations. Those guys were those guys were serious. They need to loosen up. Snort laughs. We help with that. Uh, yep. They'll never be tense again. Their family should thank us. Oh, you think we can find them? We could hold a huge party and use their broken bodies as tables. Friend chuckles. A thought for later. We have a boat to get to. These two and I. I was just called in by Stom. She dropped Grease off of Brad. Apparently he's got a little surprise for these boys. Maybe just in case we needed it. Something that'll fuck up those shoppers, something nice. An EMP bomb! Just needs a little help if it finishes quickly. It will be golden. Mm -mm. Does that make sense with the map, given where they are? So you have to get to there. He has dropped up there. Yeah, maybe. Maybe she travels more carefully, who knows. The kids know this is bullshit. Rad couldn't have made such a thing with his limited understanding of bureaucratic design. Plus, he would have shown Mike. This EMP bomb is a lie to get Greece together with him. He'll likely surrender. The things people do when they think their own organization is out to get them. Fools. But this is Kara's own fault. It is because the lie was so believable that Mike's forgery of plans to kill Greece went off without a hitch. Their work is paying off, and they couldn't be happier. That's Rad's always got good ideas. I can't wait to see the chopper crash. Maybe we can get it to Kamikaze and to its friends. I'll do everything I can to ensure you finally achieve your dream. Rush blushes, Ruth blushes with love. Her husband's support has always been her shining beacon. I love to hear the tale. I bet Shirley's cams will catch it. But the three of us really must be going. Till we meet again. Nothing, awesome, Ruth. See you soon. Door kicks open. A group of six officers pointing their guns and shouting orders. Unfortunately for them, this won't go well. The moment the boot made contact with the door, Ruth pulled the pin on a smoke grenade. By the time the door was open, the grenade was falling to the floor, erupted at the first order, blanketing the five. Noth and Ruth run out first at the... Noth and Ruth run out first, the sounds of gunfire blast. Now that they've drawn fire, Friend takes the kids' hands and runs out the other way. Screams of shock and agony can be heard behind. Nothing new at this point to the kids, but not welcome regardless. Two teams have fallen. Let's see, one there. Yep, that's two. The kids can only hope that there are many more coming, or perhaps they shouldn't. Not if it's just a few more groups, too few or to even threaten Noth and Ruth. They're going to need dozens to engage at once, preferably with full military force. All right, now we get to Fisher. I should note something above here. All right, all of their lockies noted. Friend proves himself as having more awareness of the environment than the kids ever thought possible. He scales ahead every 20 feet, waves the kids up. They slinkly, they slinky their way to the Earth Sciences Building. Two or sciences. I just need to do that. Slinky. Ah, uh, sure. Fortunately, for the agents at least, it seems like there's no more coming. No incoming helicopters are heard, but this is not unexpected. Rock design makes them as quiet as possible, both for passengers and those outside. However, they do have lights, and none can be seen by another friend or the kids. They enter the building and head down to the basement. There's been movement. 
Fisher really leaves, preferring to eat rations down here. So there's been a little dust pile up in places. Those have been disturbed. Prepare yourselves. Linda and Mike nod, already aware of this fact. The three sneak up to the door. Already cracked open. It's okay. It's just me here. You, th you should take a lesson from the... You should take a lesson from my newest and remain silent in a certain territory. Not that I can hear your footsteps. Oh, well, I... Er, er, uh, it's just you here. No, wait, really? The three newcomers look at the canal, ever clear, and devoid of, devoid of a boat. Fisher is nowhere to be seen. Linda and Mike know what happened. Fisher knows this is the end, so he fled. Their fake contingency plans worked as intended. Now the agents can't escape eas easily. They hide their satisfaction. You imagine here when I arrived, there's a stock of fuel missing in rations. He ditched us, simple as that. How unfortunate. Well, once we deal with things here, we'll wait for them to send another boat. Then tell them about Fisher did, and maybe get to fix his attitude. That won't happen. Not with that, I'd no, I mean that we won't be... He won't be here receive... He won't be here to receive anyone. If Caravan sends a group with this breach, they don't know what's happening, but I do. It's the end of the headquarters. Friend rolls his eyes. He was about to disagree, but Swift holds up a hand. I met up with Scout. This situation is far, far worse than just what little piece they saw before the office was taken. Lena holds her walkie behind her, switching it on and broadcasting to Vets. He and Vet are either dead or captured. Though, knowing Vet, he likely killed himself to avoid that. Scout reports that the entire campus is surrounded. There's dozens of cars and at least 50 officers in reserve. With who knows how many more coming in. Not to mention the military helicopters. This is the raid, one in full force. Well, Northern Ruth killed 12 so far. With many more, too many. Eventually, they'll switch life rounds or send in their own elites. Maybe they'll even just siege. It's only a matter of time for them. What I'm concerned with is ourselves. The authorities can't have known about this canal being opened up. So the boat was our ace, but Fisher's gone and fucked that up. Then the bus. And where do we go? Try to ram the border? It's the only thing we got left. Reese fix it up, and it's a sturdy rock bus. We don't have much else to work with. We'll be shut up before we get off the campus grounds. They want to capture us alive. Not, not have stop Knopf or Ruth are with us. They'll be firing lethal rounds at anyone giving chase. We're screwed. Well, there's always a safe option. Looks to Linda and Mike. Linda switches off the walkie behind her. We'll have two young children who wandered into the campus and were captured. Who would try to kill us if there's innocence to get a cu to get cut up with us? Who always just hold a gun to their heads too? We work with we work with little kids all the time. We know what screaming sounds like. I think we can act. The we can act that well. I think we can act that out well. I'll need to channel my saddest memories to get the tears together, but I can do it. That's the spirit. We just we'll just arrange a deal where we can safely cross over with you and get out of sight of bureaucracy of officers. The neighboring nation will give you two back, safe and sound. Then they'll take care. Then they'll. Take care of us, and Barack will be happy again. Calms his breathing. This could work. The kids don't think this will work. Barack law enforcement is extremely skilled. These people won't make it to the border. Even if they somehow manage, the bus will be hit with sleeping gas, and that'll be it. The hostages will be recovered and the agents captured. We just have to get to the bus, and once we start her up, Radio it and everyone that will be collecting them. Hopefully the officers don't try to stop us with their bodies. Scout says that the tr the group sent in will inf were says that the group sent in will inf were infiltrators. Given the troubles caused by Nop and Roof, the main four should be coming in soon. We have some time before they are overwhelmed. He also said to get to the bus and to abandon him. He'll be luring away as many as he can, maybe cause a minor ruckus. He'll likely escape, but can't with us. Never liked him, but knew he was a good guy. He said to leave you behind, that you'd never talk anyway. Sniff, that sounds just like him. I won't forget him, not for a few weeks anyway. 
he said to get he said to get to the bus, not the boat. Sandy didn't trust Fisher to stay, that the guy would run off at the first chance. Looks like he was right. Never trust a man in love with the sea. To stay on land. Really, we'll have to talk to Care about their hiring standards. If we even make it bad over here, I have, have some faith. The four head up towards the bus garage. Or water. Ugh. I have to at least make it halfway. Swift scouts ahead 20 feet, looking around corners and surveying the grounds. Fortunately, it seems the officers prioritize the main, prioritize the main office. With Knopf and Roof distracting the remaining teams, the way has been clear. When they get in sight of the garage, Swift holds up his hand, but gestures for the others to approach. They can already hear why. Just outside the main doors, Stom is making short work of a team of officers. Two already down, one she is holding as a shield. And has managed to guide a few rounds into him, snapping his neck once he, she sees hesitation. She rushes forward into the center of the three officers, who all take the tasers in hand-to-hand. -hand. But in mere moments, she downs them all, a quick hit to the one vital point each, and catching a dropped taser in the process. Stomp picks up... Picks off the gear she wants and continues to hold vigil. The four run for the garage, stomp showing genuine relief for the first time. Alright, I have to change something up here then. About friend being radioed in. She's drop ing. Mm -hmm. And was called in by stomp, dropping trees off. All right, so that'll be in progress, and this won't make as much little sense time-wise. Friend, you okay? Oh, God. Uh, too many people in a room. Friend, you're a... Friend! Oh, Christ. Friend, you're okay? As you can see, not a scratch. The same for these two. They were with the lovers. Then the best is good. Let's not tarry. Heads inside. The entire garage is completely safe. I peeked inside when I arrived. I've taken out two teams in quick succession. Grease finished it up this morning and poured in all the gas. We're golden. But what's happened to what's happened to the boat? Everyone follows Swift inside, quickly walking to the bus. Fisher fled. That little shit punches the wall, leaving a dent. I feel you, but nothing we can do about it. Care will deal with him. For now we have to get out. Anything from Rad to Grease? He got in shortly after Shirley cut out. Said he'd nearly finished a project, an EMP bomb of all things. He requested Grease assist him. We both agreed, and I escorted her over. I came right from electronics. Red friend whistles. That Rad comes up with some weird ideas. Should ask me or you for help. We'd have given him some good ideas and more weapons. Good. Thoughts on more weapons. Uh, she stops for a moment, serious, the serious tone. I don't believe that would have been necessary. Friend also adopts a serious tone. I haven't heard you speak seriously for some time. What's happened? I have a bad feeling about Rad and Grease. They were happy when I delivered her. Well, it's not so, they're not so secret lovers. What's the problem? It's more than just reuniting. There's a... This look of they shared, like they're prepared for this. A knowing look. Maybe they're just accepting that this could be the end? I don't think so. But I suppose we don't have the luxury to ponder. Fisher makes sense, at least, I suppose. All but stomp board the bus. Linda and Mike take the back seat, sitting together. Friend stands in the front. Swift takes the wheel and starts. The bus purrs to life. Grace opens the door. Nope. Stomp opens the door. Grease is not there. I am double-clicking you. Stomp opens the door and dashes inside. The bus. Grease really is a talent. We're lucky to have her. Swift looks to the garage instinctively. Same she couldn't make more feel. Half a tank isn't, isn't the best. Stop leaders at the garage and glances behind towards electronics before looking friend in the eye. 
in the eye. This isn't right. She had enough to fill the tank, said Sil herself. I saw how many tankards she had. It was enough. No one's touched this thing. Surely would have seen them enter. So something's off about that fuel. A bad feeling indeed, but she can't be a spy for Birok. Her background is clear. And no one gets in with gets in who's against care, so why would she do this? Maybe she fell in love with, with Birok and wanted to switch sides. Not much not that ridiculous given how much she drooled over their equipment. And this happened this has happened on occasion. Doesn't feel doesn't feel right. Fisher ditching us, not outside his personality. Red and Greece, though. Hey, the radio. We had no supervision over it. Rad may have contacted the authorities and made a deal. Uh, it makes sense. For whatever reason, those two decided to flip sides. Chris messed with the tankards. Maybe he filled them mostly with water or something. This way, if we ever used the bus, it wouldn't get far. Rad and her go off on their own during the prearranged raid so they can surrender peacefully. All without drawing our suspicion. It's all we got so far. You're not here anyway, and we'll likely be overwhelmed soon anyway. Get rid of this again anyway. Scout said he saw over 50 people at the campus outskirts with work coming in. Since an EMP bomb would ruin the bus as well, the other... The two either sacrificed themselves or betrayed us. It changes... It doesn't change what we have to do. Where are Nath and Ruth? We'll pick them up at least. They were by the gym last I checked. Calls them in. We're near the office. Found some military. They have real guns. Unlucky day. Come on over. We... Well, I can't say we've cleared a path. But the path was made. It's a little slick. I hear ya. Going on over. Walk you off. Sounds good. Drive the bus out and towards the power couple. Another thing. The two groups I killed came one after another. No more than a few minutes apart. For the stark level of forces I've seen, it's suspicious for them to group, group, be grouped up so tightly. Then Rad just told them how. How would he know where you were head you were heading there? There's no reason to send two teams to a bus that'll just sit there. Unless he knew about Fisher already. But I don't think so. Grease didn't have to sabotage the fuel. She could have just not fixed the bus at all. I don't think she's involved. And Rad doesn't make sense either, but I doubt he made any pee a bomb. Then he and Fisher are both, I guess? The suit doesn't fit. Why mention the bus at all? And why wasn't the boat targeted first? They have the place surrounded. They could have hit the office and Earth Sciences at the same time. And sure, we couldn't escape. No, Birok's officers must be smarter than this. And he knew the bus would be gone. So, didn't bother to mention it. That would, ex that would explain why someone was sent to the garage. But the other thing is, why two teams and... We're also back to why wasn't the garage targeted first, along with the office. I don't think the office knew about either. It could be that Rad wanted us to escape and think he and Grease were captured or killed. Us dying or fleeing would work out the same for them, wouldn't it? Maybe, but not mentioning our escape routes to people you plan to surrender to. They're going to think he's a spy. You know, this doesn't make sense. Not along the lines we're on now. Something else is going on? Something else is going on. Maybe he didn't rat out us out, but the radio was picked up. Maybe he left it on after talking to Tender, effectively bugging us. A little too convenient, but such accidents happen. Doesn't explain the garage teams. Then he decided to betray us after the fact. He realized his blender and thought he'd be punished. Which may happen, but accidents aren't always unavoidable. Regardless, it would be a demotion or something, nothing too physical. Nothing too physical. He surrendered with Greece and told him about the bus and the boat, figuring there'd be people trying to escape, and the casualties they suffered so far sent two teams. The cops sent two teams. That's the most realistic explanation. I think that fits Raz's personality, too. 
he would have been deathly afraid that he or Greece would be killed. That's why they were so happy when you saw them, they'd be together. Whether gunned down or captured, they accepted being traitors to care, just so they can spend their lives together. After all, they'd fit in here. The kids said as much. There, was, there wasn't a lot of time between our separation and the teams I killed. I suppose he could have called Surly's or Vets walking, hoping someone was listening in. Hence enough personnel were sent, or so they thought. Yes, this makes sense. Stomp's theory is that Rad left the big radio on and the cops overheard it. They raided. Rad and Grease surrendered. Rad tells them about the bus and boat. They send more teams. Regardless of how this happened, Rad and Grease do not do surrender. They become informants against care. There's no point imprisoning them or interrogating as they're so dedicated to dismantling care. They're gifted enough they can work in Biroc and blend in. The role in their story is over. While the adults have been discussing, Mike's been using Linda's walkie to speak to vets. Hmm. Mike's been... Ah. Walkie to speak to vets. Clearly vet won't be the recipient, but the officers would have taken it for intel. They brief the listener to the situation. They're in the garage on a working bus at half a tank. Two agents dropped two teams unscathed. An agent on board named Stomp has dealt with the two teams headed for the garage. She's the most dangerous one left. Dangerous one of all. Scout is a distraction and the... Hmm. The man in the woods, Scout, is a distraction. The two electronics will surrender. A boatman fled in an underground channel. Linda and Mike are hostages, Mike currently speaking, but shouldn't be in immediate danger. Hmm. Well, that's going to catch notice of the authorities, but that's okay. Swift rounds a corner and sees a few buildings down a line of bodies. Three or four teams lie broken and writhing. Knopf and Ruth seem to be interrogating, or maybe just passing the time. They wave cheer cheerily as Swift stops the bus. Hey there, so you've dealt with our little problem? Can't see any more around here? Pushovers, all of them. Especially the military, no spine. Good stuff, though. These are actual guns. Like one. Oh, baby, let me see. Ugh, more water. Ruth gets on the bus, hauling a ton of gear. Knopf follows suit, casually crushing necks with his foot, a sickening crunch with every step. The girls fawn over the good, lethal stuff. Knopf dons a little of the armor, maybe a helmet. Ooh, stun batons and stun grenades. Gonna just take a half dozen of those. You'd think they'd open up with them, but looks like they just held them. They just held on. Or you two just took them out quicker than they could throw. Scout didn't need to distract anyone at all. Should have just let you two get to work. I don't see a bruise. Please, no, Ruth and I have been training for over a decade. I'm nearly a tank, and she's faster than a panther. Hmm. Faster than a tiger. Even even if we were hit, it's not like any amount of pain would deter us at all. Unlike those pansies, one finger into the eye and they recoil. Like my honey said, no spine. Not that I particularly care, but scene scout. Linda once more flicks her walkie on and broadcasts the vets. Leaking the agent's conversation. Nope. I assume whatever distraction he planned was... Died up in some of the fosses. Maybe why they haven't invaded in full yet. Maybe we should leave now, before they rush in. Alright, turns the bus around and heads west. Where are we headed? West to the border. First, that will pick up Tender the Secus. He won't be able to escape on his own. Not now. Not anymore. Pop, pop, pop. Kachink. A hail of sounds erupts from above, and the bus takes some hits to the tires. Fortunately for the agents, the tires of Biroc are extremely resilient. We've got roof fire! Stomp opens the window and fires three shots, hitting three people on a nearby roof. 
and often roofs open other windows and let loose on anyone they can detect. Swift floors it as everyone can see a horde of people running in, at least a hundred with more fire firing from the rooftops. We're finally facing the main force. Let's give them a warning, warm welcome. Opens a window and expertly fires shots along with the others, hitting almost every time. This is a quick exchange. The agents demonstrate their masterful skills at landing shots in a moving bus on uneven ground and with little to aim for as the officers take cover. Swift swerves a little to throw off the officer's aim, but otherwise just trying to exit the campus. Grounds as soon as he can while avoiding hitting anyone, as that would slow the bus. The officers all avoid lethal hits, but take shots to legs and shoulders. They all manage to land their shots on the tires, but Biroc vehicles are made to withstand the sharpest of rocks. Their helping enough hits one area to break them apart. Otherwise, they take cover behind walls and trees, avoiding being run over. Some will aim for the window, shattering a few, but not enough to threaten the agents. After three, 30 seconds of this, Swift reaches the outer edges and encounters the main force. Alright, so 30 seconds doesn't make sense. It would take a bit longer than that. A few minutes. Fortunately, they don't re erect, didn't erect any kind of barricade, so Swift blows by. The various cars quickly falling behind. The stomp grabs Mike and pushes his head out the window. We've got hostages. Chase us and they're dead. Pulls back into the safety of the bus, releasing Mike. No offense, Bubble. You'll need to play your part. Then taken. Stays put, preparing to summon tears if needed. Alright, to the review of what everyone's at. The chase. A few minutes pass. The bus keeps speeding down old, unkempt roads. Many rocks and branches flitter the path, but Swift manages the bus just fine. He keeps it at a good pace, not, but not floored. That would be dangerous on this terrain, even for a bus this hearty. About a thousand feet behind is a convoy of cars, keeping the distance. I don't think they're taking us seriously. After what we just did at the campus, they must know we're highly skilled and better at this than them. We could cut off Mike's hand and toss it off the window. Nah, fee. We don't need to go that far yet. They're not going to be deterred with just a threat. I'm working on some tears now. Sniffs. Maybe play up my distress if they get too close. If you start ha harming us, they might call us a lost cause anyway. Well, that's terrible. It's more efficient. I can understand, but rather it doesn't come to that personally. All walkies go off. Someone's broadcasting on all frequencies. Linda's doesn't as she's broadcasting herself. But she's in the back of the bus while everyone else near the front. A commanding voice comes through the through the others. Congratulations on your success so far. If you were uh, if you were of this nation, I may even have offered you a position after the retraining period, of course. Not only did you slaughter our infiltration team, but even managed to escape the campus. Though the fact you needed one of our buses is just a tad ironic. Don't you think? A uh, friend responds on all frequencies. You'd be proud your bus was of great help to us. It's showing us great fortitude on the biggest stage. A huge raid. That didn't go so well for you, I hear. Our loving dovey couple has made or killed over 20 of yours. Unfortunate losses. We weren't aware of just how capable you lot were. All we could hear were, was basic chatter over your walkies. Not the best idea, by the way, using any radio communications in the middle of enemy territory. We learned a lot. Even so, enough so that we knew where to hit first, that little command center of yours. Must have taken quite a bit of work to get those security cams working again. Shameless Surly will be the one watched from, watched from here on out. Perhaps we'll put him in the same room as that now paraplegic older man. The commander lies about Vet being alive. Off responds back on frequencies. Just what I expect from best you call us back on Razawaki. I've got the one. That one opened at all times. I'm using Shirley Surleys to speak with you. I'll broadcast to Hot Stoppers, and you can call me with friends. Commander switches frequencies and is now coming in through just stomps. Off greeting his teeth. 
As I was saying, you prick, I'd expect nothing less from the land of cold-hearted, uncaring shits. You people, your people mean nothing to you. And nothing to you either. This must be an here. I hear you really hate us, and for a decidedly stupid reason too. Birok grew stronger the day you left. Nuff crushes his walkie and punches out a window. Nuff hugs him, and he slowly calms. Never has he been angrier. The commander has successfully silenced the brute. Need water. Sounds like you really did hear a lot, enough to get our names and personalities. We have many of your group caught, and some far more forthcoming with information than others. In due time, we will know all about your organization, goals, numbers, everything. You can make this easy on all of us by just surrendering. This may be good for practice and training, but I'd rather not have any more people die if I can avoid it. Think things through. You have a lot of country to drive through before reaching the border. That bus will give out before you exhaust whatever fuel you've ground up. You don't want any more of your people dying? Then what about the little boy we have here? He's still in one piece so far. We're hanging back for that exact reason. Just keep him near the windows where we can see we'll stay here. Having the boy will forfeit your hand. The same goes for his friend. She used to scoot to the window and stay there. Linda moves to the window. My men saw her on board. I don't know why you're bothering taking kids, but I suppose you're truly afraid of our strength and took an unnecessary risk. All it takes is missing persons report and a quick search to find you all. Granted, you sabotage yourself using radios. Well, we don't. Well, we didn't doubt your abilities. Just figured if you learn about us, that you'd be a bit better with your raid. We had over 100 people on site with more incoming military to boot. We took this very seriously. Your accents on the radio betraying your origins to other lands. We can't have terrorists running free. I was expecting more of a resistance, personally. Maybe a backup plan. A bus, though, not a very good idea. Not the stealthiest of exits. We'll get back to business, shall we? We have two kids here, on board, safe for now. Just let us through the border, and we'll let them go. Easy, and if you can't, then since our safety isn't guaranteed, neither is theirs. Barak has no arrangements with the nations, as I'm sure you're quite aware. Our neighbors won't be able to guarantee the kids' safety in any way other than their word. A voice comes in on the radio, on the canner side. This is the P4, P-151 situation. Agreed. Send in the call. One moment. I need to speak with my subordinates. Let's take a break for a minute. The commander purposely broadcast both the aid himself. He heard Mike's P-242 comment earlier and is reporting back, alerting them that they'll have a few troops near the destination. Got something up your sleeve? Lucky goes silent. Guess so. Linda's still broadcasting and unbeknownst to the agents. Noff, meanwhile, has gone a good deal thanks to wipey headpats. What's a P-51 mean? Don't know. I don't know that one. These are numbered from one on. Ugh, too many. You've heard these terms. Here and there, sometimes in town we overhear cop lingo. Say, he was broadcasting to all channels earlier. How we... No, we know they've been listening to us for at least a little while. Not the whole time we were here, but maybe a day. That's not my concern now. We all have our walkies, right? Each agent sounds off, and they do. In fact, we'll have our walkies. Except Noff, who crushed his. That takes care of us, but... Looks over to Linda. I don't believe I heard anything from the back of the bus this whole time. I suppose it's out of power. Or maybe it's broken. There's a lot of shots. There's a lot of shots at the windows earlier. Friend starts walking over. Linda doesn't make any noticeable motions, but does turn off her walkie. I don't think I like. I don't think a child of Iraq would forget to switch batteries. With how much Brad was losing himself over those things, they can't just be broken. The window sh sh 
The windows shot were all by us. Hmm. Ah, this windows. The windows that were shot are all by us, not you. Us. At the front. Not you in the back. No, I think I see what's happening here. Grabs Mike by the throat. You two have been playing us. Friend takes Linda's walkie and inspects it. Mike gasps, trying to speak. What could we have possibly have done? Rad was in charge of the walkies. The last frequency on this thing was Vets. After what we heard of the office, there'd be no reason for it to be tuned to his. And this is quite warm. It's been on for a long time. You're right about the radio. That was Rad's area. Likely they did hear us through the through these. But the events during the raid didn't don't quite line up. If you were broadcasting to vets, one would surely be in one that would surely be in the commander's hands, then they could hear everything we said. They'd know you'd be heading to the garage, hence two teams went for it. After Greece collected some fuel, Linda did her own search, I hear, finding more. This was a ruse to sabotage the tankers, likely filled them with water, hence the garages only have full. I'm certain Greece wasn't involved, but Rad likely really liked Mike here. Maybe they hatched up a plan. Trying use trying uselessly. Ah. That is not a statement. That is a stage direction. Trying uselessly to pull Freeze Tom's grasping hand. How could I possibly influence the member of care? I'm just a kid. Kids can accomplish all sorts of things. You both took in everything about us and knew where to hit. I bet you made an offer to Rad about sta staying here indefinitely. All he had to do was sell us out, and he and Greece could live and be rocking as equals to the natives. A truly happy ending. And be targeted by care for assassination. Fred grabs Linda by the hair. That's a talk for later. Right now, we have to sell our ruthless ruthlessness to our pursuers. We have real hostages now. We have real hostages now. Ruth opens a window and fires a single shot at the car's way back, nicking a windshield. Best let them know. We can take them out if they choose to approach. They'll come for the kids at some point. Commander wasn't going to try the, the bus. All this did was alert him that something has changed. He gives an order to his men hidden near the circus. And the agents just keep screwing themselves, don't they? Good thinking. How about you? Looks at Tom. Am I... Well, you and I get cracking on these ones. Shows Linda gets the window. I'd love to. Shines a sweet smile, releasing Mike. Off and Ruth stock up to the teeth. Brenda soft performing various needle techniques on Linda and Mike, trying to learn if they did anything else. Hmm. Slamming Mike to the floor. Uh, mostly asking about the police terms P242 and P151, as they're the most relevant. The two teens hold out, as they were trained by their parents to not give in. The pain is high, as Friend is a master of the craft. Fortunately, they're nearing the circus, so the, this only lasts about five full minutes. Stomp, however, loses patience. She hasn't gone, she hasn't seen anyone resist Friend's charm like this. She tosses Linda to the floor and draws her gun. Hmm. Hmm. Alright, and we're gonna do it like this. Alright, for intense the mic man to man, stomp to Linda for girl talk. Alright, now that makes more sense. She tosses Linda to the floor and draws her gun. This operation was going smoothly until you two showed up. You tricked Friend into thinking you were supporting the cause, even pulled his blind over Vet. I was starting to trust you two after you won over Rad, Grease, and most surprisingly, Shirley. 
Surly. Your conniving ways would have been a good use to care, but you squandered your chance at serving a just cause. Despite your terrible lot in life being forced into a long life career in a field you hate, you still decided to fuck us. Worse yet, I bet you were close to some cops. Yes, I bet your parents were officers, weren't they? That's why you knew those terms. Why you were able to fool us, and why, even with friend giving you such close attention, still you don't break. Taking you in was one big bungle, but not one we have to keep shackled over our ankle. Die. Crack. Glass shatters to the side of Somp. She started dodging instinctively before the window broke, but couldn't avoid the shot entirely. Blood shoots from her left eye. She tumbles sideways to the seat, shivering and bleeding immensely from where her eye used to be. Stomp rolls to the floor. Noff and Ruth are fire back, but the sniper has already dropped from his tree and run off. Another window falls apart, and Friend is not as keen as the others, takes one to the right shoulder. He tosses Mike away and hits the floor, starting to tend to himself. Swift freaks out, turning his head to look behind him and check on the others. This movement turns the wheel just enough to take the speeding bus off-road. He turns back and tries to wrest control, but in mere moments side swipes a tree and swerves with little control. He manages to skid the bus to stop, sideways to the road, but in a clearing. One with trailers and tents. They have arrived at the circus, but with two injured agents. The snipers do their job. Fire on any threatening agents if the kids are not in sight. Throwing the kids to the floor effectively hid them, so the snipers took their shots and ran before getting killed in return fire. They were placed near the circus, since the bus would stop there, and perhaps the agents would let down their guard just a tip a bit. Regardless, the bus is stopped, and the grounds appear abandoned. The fallacy will be proven wrong shortly. Alright, going good. Hmm. The agent's end. The bus creaks after a sudden stop. The side scratched and dented from the tree. Swift is still shaking, but otherwise okay. He opens the door, ready for Tender to run in. Knopf and Ruth point their guns outward, ready for anyone to poke their heads out from the tree line. Friend presses on his shoulder injury. On his shoulder injury, but moves to stomp to help her with her eye. Linda and Mike are still on the floor, but cover their ears and close their eyes. They know what's coming. In but a few moments, grenades fly through the windows. Through the... Various broken windows. Knopf and Ruth fire to detect, deflect them, but there's too many. They take out the throwers, but have to prioritize their safety and that of the others. Flashes of light and song pressure erupt outside along with some smoke. In the bus, one flash goes off and several spell grenades hit the, to the interior. After bracing for the grenades, Linda and Mike start crawling along the floor towards the closest broken window. Swift is cursing in pain, stumbling out of the seat and falls out the bus door. As he stands, he's hit with a stun grenade and some non-lethal shots. He drops, shivering. The lovers, immune to all non-lethal means, toss out their own smokes, now covering the exit just a tad too late for Swift. The two make their exit and co take cover behind the trailer. Friend and, stop stealth, friend and Stomp stealth crawl through the smoke and make their way to some crates to hide and prepare for the shootout. The kids get to a window and hop out, running inside the nearest trailer. They are not alone. A man and a boy holding a tablet hide within. All five persons eye each other. Quite a mess you've brought with us, Linda and Mike, I presume. Ah, you must be tender then. And Timothy? Uh, yeah, nice to meet you, uh, Uncle Dender. Uncle? Just a name for me. What's happening outside? Why are you all here? I was helping Rad had contacted you during the raid. I guess the bomb was more important, not that we got to see it. Then the authorities discovered us. Shame. How? Tender just wants to learn the situation, doesn't care about the bomb business or any irrelevant details. Though he does need to verify some things first. We know they had us in the walkies. The cam commander admitted to it himself. He talked to us using Rad and Sincerely's. They've been caught, I think. Vets injured or dead. Grease was with Rad and Fisher ditched. We're all that's left. We came here to pick you up since you're not skipping on your own. 
If they overheard the shortwave radios, then they must have picked up on the longer range, yet we were left alone. It, it may not be consistent. Perhaps they missed your calls with Rad. A possibility. I'm Monica, by the way. I can tell by your voice that you're taken aback by me. There's nothing to be wary of. You, uh, Mommy is very nice. Flashing a smile. Linda and Mike realize his kid's pretty far gone. Best not to go there. Outside, shots burst every few seconds. Grenades pop. Swift's voice cries in pain. Power in. My legs. They're hit. Oh, God, I can't move. I can't. Passes out, slowly bleeding from his prized legs. Quite a fight outside. We're not going to hold out for long. We have limited resources, and they have plenty more. How did you get this far in that old bus with the rock police chasing behind? We pretended to be hostages, kept them at bay. I heard a crash earlier, and the bus looks to be missing some windows. They had some snipers up in the trees nearby. They took two shots, one got stopped in the eye, and friend in the shoulder. Ah, they will do this with hostages inside. We fell from our seats after bumping the swerve. I don't know what happened to our swift to do that. Maybe the cops blocked the road with something. The commander said to keep us in view. He must have decided that once we disappeared that we were in danger. You sound awfully truthful. This is what explained everything. An unfortunate turn of events. The question now is, what do we do? I don't think we can run. Those gunshots are everywhere. Stealth would be optimal, but you're not trained in the art. You'll have to go a more direct route. But no, I'm sorry. Hush, my boy. I'm not blaming you. I'm just saying that we can't sneak out, and we can't run. We'll have to face these people. Margo's right. We'll have to go the front way. How? We'll be shot up. The cops didn't harm you in any way, did they? No, I guess. I guess we pretend some more. Mike, work on your tail, so I'll get mine ready. How far are you willing to go for care? I know you're new, but you're willing to actively work against your own country. Pop, pop, ka -chink. Everyone in the trailer ducks down below the windows. Spies, we must. We have a dream. We're not giving up. What dream? For Bjork to open his borders, freeing his people from the tight fist grasp. And care. We need people inside for this, yes. Someone like Timothy here, who can teach those like him how to have others and to prepare for revolution. Sniffs. That sniffs. was our idea, too. Voice starting to strain. Care will handle the rest. Hmm. Can I handle the rest? Since you agree, they're all set. But one more thing. Do you truly understand what care means? Community assisted integration is religious extensions. Is religious religion bound to multiple peace by any means necessary? This includes tort. No need to go into the details. Tort? Sure. Only for the truly evil ones. Like Robert, who gave you no choice but to kill him. Just to save me. Well, yeah. And like him into mentally facepalm. Timothy is far too naive. That you realize that there's expectations from its members to perform all sorts of tasks in the name of broad peace. Of course. Then we're all set. Timothy, stand beside Linda if you would. Just rest your arm over her shoulders. Timothy does so. Linda doesn't mind. Hold Monica up so she can talk face to screen. Timothy holds up Monica and Linda le looks at her. Monica opens her port and exposes the electrodes. This is how we will be. This is how... This will be how we walk out. You are Timothy's hostage. But, but he's a rock as well, and just a kid. This... Oh, it'll work just fine. Pulls out a knife, drapes an arm around Mike's shoulder, holding the blade to his neck. This isn't some hostage play acting. That's why the cops are going ham right now. You weren't under actual threat. Now, we'll just have to show them we're serious. What? for the same team here, which is why you're going to sacrifice yourself. Timothy can perform your task you are going to do. And you two get to ensure the safety of the rest of us. I'll just have to kill one of you, or maybe cut off an ear. The cops will back off. Easy. You can't. You joined care. You're now part of this. And bound to the same rules as us. You were dedicated to achieving world peace by any means, weren't you? Well, we need to survive, and Timothy has decades of work to do for us. Your dream, though, will come to pass by your own hands. It will be carried on by the rest of us. If you're lucky, you will live through this and still help care. 
it all works out just fine. This is stupid, we didn't join just be treated like this. Well, it doesn't really matter now whether you joined or not. As members, you're expected to take all possible measures to ensure success. Dying for the cause is honorable. If you weren't on board, then you're hostages anyway. It's the same deal for us. Now enough talk. Let's get moving. Tender and Timothy escort the two out. They immediately see what's happening over the last few minutes. Ugh. Tender and Timothy escort the two out. Alright. Some frag grenades have perforated and often roof. They were disguised as stun grenades so the duo wouldn't bother shooting them back. A good plan. The two have now taken real damage and are bleeding heavily. Swift lies passed out on the ground by the bus. His legs bleeding, the smoke cleared. Friend and Sop have managed to manage on their own by the crates. In the tree line, many trees have chunks shot out, but no one is lying face down in view. Either no cops have been hit or they've been dragged away. I have 5% on that power. Well, I guess I should close the tablet then and not worry about that. Ugh. When Tender and Timothy exit with the teens, the cops stop firing. The agents, too, stop, and all is briefly quiet. We got here. We got here. Two bright kids. Shame to lose them. Presses the knife to Mike's, to Mike's neck. A trickle of blood leaks out. But we can't have you all killing us now. How about we have a little talk? They're really smart. Trick does good. You don't want them with slit, slope, split, slit throats, do you? Not in a completely unavoidable way, huh? You'd be shouting this. Not in a completely avoidable way, huh? Commander from behind the trees peeks his head out. Hostages again. I suppose it didn't work the first time. And you're actually serious now. Very well then, what do you want? Safe passage out of the country, nothing major. As I told your compatriots, if we let you all go, there's no telling what will become of those two. Should I even ask about the little boy holding the young lady at bay? Is this a joke? Timothy has learned the folly of your arc. He is coming with us. I don't care about these two, they're just kids who will serve a grand purpose. You are free to shoot th through them to get to me if you so choose. But you have done that already. A traitorous child. Pity. But if he sided with your insane ideas, that he's no use to our nation. Timothy starts whimpering, hearing this from a high-ranking officer. Don't let his words hurt you, sweetie. You found your new family, didn't you? You're right. We're not the ones who are wrong. You and everyone else is. We'll fix this place. It'll be better for our caring country. Just you wait. While talking, Linda and Mike take advantage of the fact that no one, none of the agents, or the Monica thing, can see their faces. They blink a code to the commander. They're going to make their move soon. The commander holds his hand behind his back, signaling his troops to act when the time arises. This place is the worst. To allow for such a talented young man to be abused so verbally, emotionally, and even physically. Your people don't truly work to your fullest, not the higher-ups. Like the old ringmaster, a drunkard who did nothing for the circus but drive into the hole. So many weak links in Virok's ways, and the higher up you go, the weaker it gets. Look at Nop over there, so strong in body and mind. Yet this place brought him to the brink of to the brink just because he didn't measure up to some fucked up standard of perception. We got him out, and now it's Timothy's turn. He will show you just how strong and capable people are who grow on the outside. Chester grandly the knife away from Mike's throat of this suffocating nation. At that moment, when the knife is away from Mike, the teens act. Simultaneously, they throw their, throw their captors to the ground. Linda hip throws Timothy. As he falls, an officer shoots Monica, destroying her. Mommy! He cries cheerfully as he hits the ground. Shocked, he's unable to move. God, I can't voice act. Mike's shoulder throws tender. This is such a surprise, the man's attempt to slash Mike misses terribly. Linda and Mike jump behind where Timothy and Tender were standing, slamming to the ground as well. Tender's training gets him back up to his feet immediately, but this was an error. <clears throat> now facing several squads of cops and no human shield, hundreds of bullets rain out in seconds. He drops dead. The two the teens get up and rush for the bus. Stomp tries to aim for them, but is met with the same barrage as Tender. She stays ducked behind the crate. Linda and Mike make it to behind the bus and stand crouched on the bumper. 
The same bus that repelled the officer's bullets before now is saving them from an angry fire from the agents. The firefight continues for minutes as the officers bait shots and force the agents to use up their ammo. Knopf and Ruth still have keeping wounds, but this is exactly how Knopfy would want to go, saving his allies from the evils of Birok. The two toss out the last of their smoke grenades, covering from their trailer to the bus and further near the trees. They stand up and storm the officers. A hail of bullets hit them from behind, shot in the back by officers who circled around. The lovers fall, grasping for each other, dying grasping for each other, dying in their arms. Happy. Stomp and friend make use of their deaths, sneaking into the, the smoke and carefully getting back on the bus. They crawl to the back and prepare themselves for one last gambit. Linda and Mike have been safely waiting for the agents to perish, thinking to themselves safe, forgetting a minor detail. The back door crashes open, knocking Mike off balance and shoving Linda off. Linda reactively reaches for Mike and grabs his right arm as Friend grasps his left, trying to pull him in. Friend, not being the strongest agent, Friend, with his injured shoulder, struggles to get Mike inside, pulling against Linda's added weight. She's barely touching the ground, but it's giving her all to pull Mike. Mike tries to use the bus as leverage to pull away. Stomp fires shots out the window, covering Friend's back. Come on inside, Mike. You've got a duty to sacrifice yourself. Get with the program. Just make a deal or something. Use your head for once, not just your hands. They're not going to make a deal with us without leverage against them. They just kill us. Like the, They just killed the lovers. Clearly, they don't need us alive. But you and Linda, they want to keep you. You're both so talented. This act. Act failed twice, give up already. Turns his head to Linda, gives her a look, then back to friend. We of care don't just give up, we try harder. Where's that bureaucratic work ethic? Oh, right, you had nothing to begin with. Hated her job so much, you've amused joining us. Such a weak spirit. I can fix that for a day's long talk. Just you and me. Then you're not letting us go. We can talk about that later. Should really consider that now. That now. Linda releases Mike, and he launches into Friend, shoulder slamming him and bumping the man to the boss stomps back, pushing her slightly away. As the slam lands, Mike grabs the stun baton in Friend's belt and thwomps him in the groin, discharging it. Friend, a torturer by trade, has never received his treatments himself. His grip loosens, and he is briefly stunned. Mike pushes off the body and launches out the door which Linda hurls open, exposing those inside to the hard-working men and women on the Bureau Police Force. Friend and stop. Take hundreds of bullets into the chest, back, leg, head, legs, arms, no place is spared. Now for these two extremely dangerous and cunning individuals. All is quiet. Alright, that technically makes it 26, so I have to adjust that. Alright, part 7 is 26. I just have one part left, and I can deal with that tomorrow. How long is page 8 generally? 12? Alright, that's fine. I can total this up and be done with it. Uh, hold on. Wait a minute. That's the wrong age layer. 13. Yep, almost done. Then I can just start off the next one.